I now like to talk to you about the uh, remote access side of things. I want to talk a little bit about what a, a DMZ and, and all that stuff is as well. So uh, as, as we move on here, uh, I mentioned Active Directory. You know, it came out in the year 2000. Uh, originally, it was called, uh, it was an operating system called NT5, and then Windows 2000 is when they released it with, um, uh, and they changed the name. They changed the name from NT5 to Windows 2000, and the directory service used to be called NTDS, and they renamed it to Active Directory, okay? So, uh, 20 years ago, you know, Active Directory came out. This was cutting edge. It was great. It was awesome. And uh, one of the things that we sometimes need to happen is we need computers on the outside world to get to the inside world, right? So imagine you've got uh, a computer here, maybe you got somebody working from home and they need to be able to access a resource, like maybe they need to access that file server. Well, let me tell you what you don't want to do. You don't want to just open up a bunch of ports on your firewall and let things in. Like uh, file servers in Windows use a, uh, use a protocol called SMB, Server Message Block, uh, and that uses a port 445, and there's a few other ports here too, but uh, you would be opening ports coming in to let things come in from the internet, and that's very dangerous, right? We don't want to do that on our firewall. We don't want to open up file ports and all that because uh, we're just asking for um, a bad guy, all right? We're asking for a hacker to attempt to get into our environment, right? So let me just make a hacker here. All right. Let's just zoom in on him. We're going to make him a bad guy here. Let's give him some devil horns. Let's give him a devil tail. All right. We'll, we'll make him look like he's just in a bad mood. All right. Okay. All right. Sometimes I get a little carried away. Sorry. All right. So there's my hacker. All right. And we don't want we don't want to open up a bunch of ports because we don't want a hacker to be able to get in. Right. That's essentially where we're going with this now. Uh, we do have somebody over here, though, that we do want to get in. So maybe uh, we're going to let them do that. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do that. One would be um, to get something called a VPN concentrator or VPN router. It's a, basically an appliance, a box that you put on your network and you let people securely get in. Now, the Microsoft way, sort of their solution usually, is to set up a server called a RAS server, sometimes referred to as an RAS server. Okay. And that RAS server uh, is a remote access server. And from what we can do there is we can allow uh, access with our firewall. We can allow what's known as a VPN, a virtual private network. So from there, you're, you can securely connect from this outside world to that RAS server. And you can access this file server or some other resources. And it's all going to be encrypted using what's called an encrypted tunnel. Okay. Uh, and that's going to be one of your main ways and one of your safest ways to allow things to come in. Okay, another thing Microsoft supports is a thing called direct access, uh, which are not really focusing a lot on that these days. But VPN is going to be one of the main ways that you do this. Okay, there are other solutions. You can set up this thing called a remote desktop gateway and allow remote desktop in. But VPN is going to be your main core way to do things. Okay. Now, the other thing I'd like to, to, to mention is what about situations where we have something uh, like a server that we need to make available to the outside world, okay? Uh, let, like, let me give you an example. Let's say that you are hosting your own web server, all right? You have a web server and you are hosting it. You're not going to pay GoDaddy or somebody like that to do it. You're going to host your own web server. Well, here's the question. Where are you going to host it? Are you going to host it in here? Are you going to host it out here? Well, I'm going to tell you, if you host it in here, that's dangerous. Because, you know, if you're letting web, uh, people get to your web server anonymously, then, you know, you got people coming in here and, and going through your firewall and accessing that web server. Well, you know, hackers can do this thing called pivoting. If they gain control over that server, they might be able to pivot to other resources. So that would not be a good idea. Uh, a better solution would be to store the web server out here, okay? The problem, though, with storing it outside your firewall like that is you are not really giving uh, your web server any protection. It's exposed completely to the elements at that point. It's outside the firewall. So uh, generally, the, the rule of thumb, what most people would do with this is they would get uh, they would actually get a another firewall, okay? 
and and they put the other firewall actually next to their internet and at that point you have uh, something called a DMZ a demilitarized zone also known as a perimeter network so there are a couple of names for that DMZ perimeter network and the great thing about that is I can police now the traffic flowing in through the firewall I can police that I might allow like for example port 80 443 you might have a DNS and if you do you do uh, you know port 53 but now people can get to this web server coming in but then you could block everything except maybe your VPN and all that going through that firewall so that is the idea of a DMZ so if a hacker was to gain control over that web server they would still be blocked and would not be able to flow through that firewall that's the logic okay of this all right so um, now the uh, so the concepts here is there's multiple solutions when it comes to trying to allow people out allow people in if you're wanting to host something like a web server maybe you want to do the same thing with an email server Microsoft has exchange and you have a, a type of exchange role called edge which of course uh, we could have a what's called an exchange edge server in there um, and really you know the mentality there is the the logic has always been with uh, with the world that at least in IT we've always kind of felt as IT people we needed to sort of host everything ourselves and manage everything ourselves and uh, I want to I want to kind of go over um, a couple of things in that regard let me just kind of move some of this out of the way to make some room here all right so uh, first off um, I talked about centralization in a domain and the fact that we have to have central control uh, GPOs are going to be one of our main ways to do that. Microsoft also has another server that helps you get even more control over your environment. And uh, in the 90s, they called it SMS, System Management Services. And then in the early 2000s, they renamed this uh, server that I'm about to tell you about to SCCM, which is uh, System Center Configuration Manager. Okay. And so for the longest time, that's what it is. That's what it was called. And System Center Configuration Manager can uh, even more so control your devices. It can inventory devices. You can deploy images. You can deploy applications. You can configure compliance. I mean, there's a ton of stuff you can do with SCCM. All right. Um, and more recently, that got renamed to another product. It is no longer called SCCM. Hopefully, this is not a shocker to you. Uh, it is now called Endpoint Config Manager. I'm just going to put CM, Endpoint Configuration Manager. All right. And this is because of a product that they're deploying in the cloud called Intune that has sort of become the big cloud-based system for managing things. And what they want is they want, in, they want Config Manager and this other product, Intune, to sort of centrally uh, work together. And so they renamed uh, Config Manager to Endpoint Configuration Manager. And so that's what it is now uh, referred to as. All right. Okay. Now, um, the, the last thing I want to mention here is that uh, another sort of logic that we've had over the years when it comes to managing things as IT people is that, you know, we got to have all these different servers, right? Like we have to have an Exchange server. All right we got to have a SharePoint server, I'll just say SPT. We got to have a database server like SQL, SQL, and we've already got a file server, right? Let me use that little file server here. Actually, I'll, I'll uh, just for the sake of keeping the font sizes the same, we'll, we'll just make it a little bit smaller so it'll fit here. So we got a file server. Now, the mentality has always been that we have to host all these servers ourselves, okay? And uh, we have to have all this equipment in order to do it. And so you end up with a lot of servers in order to, to deal with everything. Okay, so in the early 2000s, a company called VMware uh, really came, came to, the, to the table with some some innovative solutions for dealing with the problem of having so many servers, so much hardware. Uh, and they, they came up with, uh, I actually used an old solution to fix newer problems. There's a 
thing called hypervisors. This was a term that actually came out in the 1970s, back in the Unix days, early Unix days, and it was a virtualization idea. Hyper, hypervisor is not a new thing. It's actually been around for a long time. Okay, so they actually um, uh, really came up with some cutting edge stuff on this. And the concept was that, you know, if you can emulate hardware, you know, processors and RAM and storage and network, you can then put software on that emulated hardware. So the idea of a virtual machine, you know, is a emulated hardware and you've got software installed on that, like, like server, Windows 10, Windows Server, all that. So you could take these four servers, these four physical servers, and you could actually run them on a single physical server, okay? Uh, so instead of having so many different, you know, pieces of hardware here that you're trying to deal with and manage, you could do it all on a physical server. Of course, a lot of people, when they see that, they're like, I mean, now you've got a single point of failure. Well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, so VMware really took off. Uh, Microsoft definitely took note of what they did. Microsoft actually bought a product called Virtual PC and then turned it into Virtual Server, and then eventually they renamed it to Hyper-V. So that is actually the Microsoft virtualization solution, even though VMware is still probably considered more popular uh, than, than Hyper-V. So the other thing that we've got here is the fact that we have a, a single point of failure uh, I mentioned. If that server dies, we're in trouble, right? Well, see, that's the beauty of virtualization. We have the ability of actually uh, very easily getting another server. All right, let me shrink this down a little bit. We can get a, another server. We can use a storage area network. We can host our virtual machines on that. And the Hyper-V servers can do clustering. So you can get a very high level of redundancy with the help of virtualization, okay? Um, and so that's the idea of virtualization. Now with virtualization came another term, and it's the term elasticity. Elasticity means that those uh, servers can have tons of memory, tons of, of a storage, tons of network bandwidth, tons of CPU usage, and they can pool it. So if the exchange virtual machine needs more memory and the SQL virtual machine doesn't, then you know SQL can give up the memory it's not using and the exchange virtual machine can use that memory and CPU usage. And so, and it can shrink and grow and shrink and grow, okay? And that's one of the greatest benefits of virtual machines. Another great benefit of virtual machines is the fact that you have these things called checkpoints, uh, all which used to be called snapshots, okay? But they're now called checkpoints, uh, at least in Hyper-V terms they are. So this really, really changed things. And uh, as you'll see, uh, this is also sort of the forerunner of cloud computing, all right? Okay, but hopefully that gives you guys now a decent foundation of some of the other concepts, uh, remote access, DMZ, as well as the basics idea of virtualization. Hey, this is John Christopher. I hope you enjoyed that video, and I want you to know that I'm trying really hard to grow this channel, so I hope you'll give me a like and a subscribe. Also, if you'll check the description in this video, I've got a link for you that can show you how you can get access to all my different courses. I have lots of different Microsoft certification courses that'll help you pass your exam. All right, thanks a lot for watching the video, and I hope to see you again.